Hey folks, this is Abel James, and thanks so much for joining us on the Fat Burning Man Show, where we talk about real food and real results. Are you constantly sanitizing and sterilizing, frantically trying to kill every bug in your midst? This increasing obsession with sterilizing everything around us may actually be doing more harm than good. Returning to the show today is Dr. Ruscio, a best-selling author, doctor of natural medicine, doctor of chiropractic, clinical researcher, and host of Dr. Ruscio Radio. On today's show, we're talking about the drawbacks of growing up in a long-term sterile environment, how to feed your body's ecosystem, tools for healing your gut, and tons more. Before we get there, here's a note that came in from Jen. She wrote, My husband and I happened to stumble upon your book in a used bookstore. We are at a point in our life that we know we need to get healthy again. We have gained weight, led a sedentary life, etc. We have a special needs child who will most likely live with us for life. So if nothing else but for her, we need to stay as healthy as possible. So there I was in the bookstore looking at cookbooks, trying to find a good vegetarian or paleo or something, and your book stuck out. I've been reading it, and we have changed the way that we eat. We started just two weeks ago, loosely, not following your precise meal plan and still substituting a few ingredients, but have already both dropped 10 pounds. We feel better physically and mentally. So excited to begin this new journey, Jen. Jen, thank you so much. I'm, I'm glad that you're doing this together. I'm really happy you found, uh, uh, you know, the book in a used bookstore, which people can do, you know, internationally. It's really amazing because I wrote this book back in 2015, 2016, The Wild Diet, has a lot of recipes in there. I wrote it to be as relevant and valid 10 years from the time that I wrote it, you know, 100 years from the time that I wrote it, than it was the day it came out. So I'm really glad that you're still, you know, enjoying that, getting some great recipes. Yes, they're meant to be templates, you know, all recipes and, and a hidden dirty secret, even though my wife and I are best selling cookbook authors of many different cookbooks. Most of the time, we're kind of experimenting, especially me, I'm throwing ingredients together. And then we kind of estimate, you know, what we did after the fact, and then try to replicate it. So all of these different recipes are really meant to be templates. Everyone has different uh, ingredients available to them at different times. Um, swaps are easy enough to make, especially if you have dietary restrictions, or you'd like to color outside the lines a little bit more. So that's good on you, Jen. And I'm glad that uh, you and your hubby are doing this together. It's, it's really important important that uh, you don't try to do this alone. You know, if, if you have to, then you can for sure, but it definitely makes it easier when you have other people to make you accountable that you can rely on other people to pick up the slack with cooking and that sort of thing. So good on you. And then as far as, um, you know, taking care of a special needs child, we have a number of people in, in our close friend group who have a special needs child. And, you know, changing the way that you eat as a family can really uh, not only make you accountable, and I'm, I'm glad you built that in, but also help you all feel better together and, and, you know, move on that path toward healing. So young or old, when you prioritize real foods and cut down on industrial oils, sugar, and processed junk, your body can finally heal itself. And you and your husband already shedding 10 pounds in two weeks, that's, that's not too shabby. So thanks for giving the wild diet a try. And the trickle effect, keep this in mind too, it often starts with shedding a bit of weight, but also can lead to feeling better in a lot of other ways, having more energy to dedicate to other parts of your life and really grow things there, more focus, and just more overall gusto for life. So look forward to that, and kudos to you both. Keep in touch. Let us know how it goes. And if you enjoyed The Wild Diet, uh, the book, <laughs> My Diet is Better Than Yours on ABC TV, the TV show that we did back a while and years ago now with with our friend Sean T or you like anything else you just want to get in touch shoot me a line at able at fatburningman.com that's my email I respond to as many as I can and if you have a question if you have a comment or if you're looking for one-on-one -on -one coaching just shoot me an email you know you can also follow me on social media lately you know I'm not it's a double-edged sword right but uh, Instagram has been very active lately you can find me at fatburningman on Instagram, um, also Facebook, Twitter, and some of the new ones that are coming out. We're trying to spread a wide net at used bookstores and reality TV shows, podcasts, 
you know, relatively unknown social media networks, VR channels, and all the rest of it. So wherever you are, look us up under Abel James, Fat Burning Man. Sometimes it's even easier to direct message me on that platform than it is to email. So I try to get back to as many of you as I possibly can. Get in touch. I always love hearing from you. Now, a quick plug before we get to the show, due to industrial farming practices and the fact that much of our soil has been degraded, most people don't get enough nutrients from their food alone. This is just one of the reasons why my wife Allison and I started up Wild Superfoods to make it easy for you to load up on critical nutrients your body needs to thrive in the face of an uncertain future. One of our favorite ways to support our own microbiome is with our probiotics from Wild Superfoods called probiotic spheres, and they pair wonderfully with our best-selling future greens. Now, what does wild mean, anyway? Well, we work with the laws of nature, not against them. We avoid anything artificial, genetically modified, or overly processed. At Wild Superfoods, each of our products is lab-tested and formulated according to the latest cutting-edge developments in research, science, and medicine. Guaranteed nutrition, no matter where you are. And right now, you can get a deal on probiotic spheres by heading on over to wildsuperfoods.com. Just type it in right now to that menu bar on your phone, tablet, computer, or anything else, VR goggles you might be using right now you can check out our latest deals at wildsuperfoods.com right now we're only available in the u.s but hopefully we'll be expanding soon enough uh, so just go to wildsuperfoods.com to check all that out thanks for listening we'll see you there all right on to the show with dr michael ruscio we're talking about problems with long-term sterile environments feeding your body's ecosystem and the power of harnessing internal health tools for healing your gut what to do about stress and tons more. Let's go hang out with Dr. Ruscio. Welcome back, folks. I'm happy to say that returning to the show today is Dr. Michael Ruscio. Dr. Ruscio is a best-selling author, doctor of natural medicine, doctor of chiropractic, clinical researcher, and podcast host. Dr. Ruscio's work has been published in peer-reviewed medical journals, and he is a committee member of the Naturopathic Board of Gastroenterology Research Division. I can't believe I just made it through that without <laughs> totally messing it up. But thank you so much for coming back on the show, good sir. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Good to see you again. Great to see you too. Even if it's not in person, we should be hugging it out at some dinner in right. Austin probably right now. But it's too hot there anyway. So um, why don't we start with something that a lot of people are totally obsessed about right now, which is the necessity for sterile environments everywhere and the idea that that's 100% a good thing. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> that... It used to be a much easier conversation to have, reminding people um, the importance of contact with dirt. And, and one of the one of the clarifications I try to make in in healthy good healthy you is what I call new dirt versus old dirt. So not not all dirt is the same. There, there's definitely this observation that you're alluding to. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> Um, there, there's definitely this observation that you're alluding to, which is exposure to dirt, animals, bacteria has a training effect on the immune system, much like the the pressure of gravity has a strengthening impact on bone or on muscle. So thinking that we could protect someone from gravity would be foolish. No one would think that. This, but this, the same parallels to the immune system, that it, it is a system that requires exercise or, or the stimuli to develop. So with that said, a public urinal as compared to maybe a farm, yeah. that would be new dirt versus old dirt. So we want to be discriminating, at least in my opinion, there, there's not necessarily, well, actually there is some data showing that exposure to sewage in Bangladesh leads to more parasitic infection and GI illness, whereas exposure to animals and blood um, and dirt with, I believe it was the Hadza hunter-gatherers, also led to a um, increased exposure, but not accompanied by diarrheal illness. So if we can try to frame this as not all dirt is equal, because you know there are some who, well, I'm paleo, and you know they go do lots of things in a new dirt environment and don't wash their hands. Right. I, I understand the sediment, uh, but you know, or sentiment, but it, it might be a little bit ill-advised. Um, but you know, to, to your to your point, we want to get that exposure. If you're in an old dirt environment, a park, the woods, a farm, um, 
try not to really wash up too much afterward because you may kind of want to bring some of those bacteria home. Yeah. And there are data, for example, showing that people who live on farms have more bacteria in their bed. And even though that sounds kind of gross, that's just a continuation of those bacteria which train your immune system, including the immune system on your skin. But with COVID and with exposure to public places where there's a lot of exposure to new dirt, that's where you may want to be a little bit more discerning and, and kind of wash up afterwards. And that differentiation is so important, the new dirt versus old dirt idea, because there are many uh, farmers and my dad's side of the family, we're all farmers. They grew up on a farm. My brother's an organic farmer and uh, or a no, no spray, no till farmer, just old school. And there are a lot in those communities who just kind of, you know, they go <laughs> full bore and shoot the moon uh, in the sense that they want kind of as much exposure to grime and dirt and, and all of that, even involved with animals, because it trains the immune system. Yet, if anyone who's traveled internationally, especially to the other side of the world uh, or to a third world country, knows exactly what happens, you know, when you get there. And that's usually you get ill to some degree or you get diarrhea or whatever. And no matter how clean you try to make it, if you're eating or if you're drinking water or whatever, to some degree, these new bugs attack us and, and we don't stand a chance compared to, you know, these ecosystems that used to have a lot less uh, just throughput of, of different organisms, especially humans. But humans now being a worldwide creature, we're tracking bugs all over the world. And you also make another good point, which I think is important to mention, because, you know, when you look at this body of literature, there, there's a few confounding factors that, that are hard to account for at first. As one example, I guess let me lead with with kind of like the, the point, which is timing also seems to be important in dictating if a given organism could be pathogenic or commensal for an individual. And and this is where in, in reviewing a lot of the, the research that I kind of compiled into Healthy Good Health You, you look at H. pylori or Helicobacter pylori and when that colonizes an individual at a young age, it may actually be beneficial. But at an older age of colonization, it may be pathogenic. And then there's some nuance in terms of certain strains, maybe more virulent than others, but the, the general trend still stands that early exposure, kind of like in a third world country to some of these bugs, they may become commensal. And that is likely because the immune system is still attuning itself to up to about the third year of age. So if you get that organism exposed in the entombment window, now it's kind of part of the gang, so to speak. Yeah. But if you first become exposed when you're 25 or 30, that's when it may become pathogenic for you. So timing is also important. And maybe even all the more reason for parents when their children are young not to be so uh, you know, sterile happy. Again, certain discriminations to make. Um, but yeah, that, that early exposure seems to really help make it a, a organism that the immune system kind of calibrates to. That's really interesting because when you look at childhood developmental psychology and the early learning window for languages, it seems like that's kind of built in as well, right? If you're exposed to a half dozen different languages at a young age, then a lot of times you, you wind up speaking all of those languages and understanding them to a certain degree that if you try to just put you know, those eight years of exposure and development in your 30s, good luck speaking six languages. Yep, totally. And kind of like you, I, I'm not sure when, when you learned how to play those six instruments there behind you, but was that earlier in life? Pretty young, you... yeah. Well, it was before yeah. puberty really hit that I got exposure to and at least played around with most instruments, but instruments of a different kind from each other, if that makes sense. So I played drums, and but I started on woodwind instruments, and then I got really into guitar and those are different enough um, that I think if you build in those skills or that early exposure, it becomes a lot easier to, it's more like picking it back up instead of starting from scratch later in life, which is a real thing. If you never were an athlete, if you never exercised really, if you never played a sport, it's gonna be a lot harder to do powerlifting in your 30s, right? You can't just jump into CrossFit the same way that an ex-footballer would be able to. Right, yeah, and that was something when I was in college, I, I did exercise therapy for a while. And it'd be amazing to see two people, um, similar complaints, similar body composition, but you could tell within 30 seconds 
person A had an athletic background, person mm-hmm. B clearly did not. So yeah, it's uh, I guess all coming back to this window of the importance of exposure to these various things, whether it be bacteria or a flute <laughs> early in life makes it easier to uh, learn or, or to kind of uh, deal with, I suppose. Yeah. It, you know, and reading through, I really did love going through uh, your book, but I want I wanted to bring up a couple of the passages there. One that was really interesting to me is the earlier in life antibiotics are used, the more damaging they are. And that kind of, you know, dovetails with with what we were just talking about. Right. Right. Yeah. So it's kind of like the inverse observation uh, where the um, earlier the exposure to what we would maybe call old dirt, the more beneficial it may be because there may be that developmental window. And then once you're out of that window, the exposure no longer vectors benefit. And the inverse seems to apply for antibiotics. I do try to be really careful in the book to uh, clarify for patients, this is a case-by-case situation. So if there is an infection that could potentially be life-threatening or lead to long-term damage, clearly use the antibiotic. Um, but if your child has a fever and the doctor is considering using antibiotics kind of prophylactically to prevent a secondary bacterial infection, then, which is really falling out of favor. Um, but if you had an old school doctor and you felt like they were using antibiotics a little bit too indiscriminately, then that is something that there have been some elegant studies which have shown the earlier the antibiotics are administered, the more harmful they seem to be. And in some cases, a decade later in life, which may manifest as a metabolic disorder later in life. Uh, so there is definitely something there. And it really comes down to the gut and how the gut colonization tunes the immune system and how the immune system leads to either this pro-inflammatory or um, I don't even want to say anti-inflammatory, just, just the correct inflammatory response. Yeah. But in Western thought, you know, we're, we're kind of trained to see the body as some sort of furnace that burns, you know, one calorie at a time, yet we're feeding a whole ecosystem for better or worse, especially when you start looking at the gut, when you look at what happens happens to your body from the inside out, the uh, conversation becomes a lot more complex than just a, a furnace of some kind. Sure. And and there does seem to be a, a trend line of caloric intake and body composition. Sure. But, but then within that kind of Gaussian distribution, perhaps what accounts for some people doing better or worse on a given caloric intake could be their microbiota. And there is some inferential data we can use to kind of support that, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth has been associated to heavier weights. So it it hasn't been as completely demonstrated that treating that leads to weight reduction, although one or two studies have found improvements in blood glucose and cholesterol. The impact on weight that's been published has been nominal. Uh, but it, it may be that there hasn't been a large enough sample size, or it could be there's also no relationship there. But the observation at least stands that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth does seem to trend with people being at a heavier weight. And part of that might be due to the bacteria help to extract more calories from food. So there's kind of this caloric harvesting hypothesis Um which, and not to get too kind of convoluted here, but this does tie into another theme, which is sometimes we'll go to a hunter-gatherer band, look at their diet, and say this diet is what we should be eating here in the West. And a lot of this typically follows a, they're eating more fiber, so we eat more fiber. But actually, some of these, uh, like the Hadza hunter-gatherers, have a higher colonization density of one of the SIBO bacteria, Methanobrevibacter smithii. And in the context of the Hadza, a lower calorie, higher fiber diet, it helps them survive because it slows down the speed at which the food moves through the intestine. So more calories can be extracted. So they have this really dense diet. They don't probably have enough food. So the bacteria are in an adaptation, slow the food down, get as much out of it as you can, and it works for them. But in Westerners, that correlates with being overweight and having constipation. So we have to be really careful with looking at another culture, a different atmosphere, a different diet, and saying we can pluck out one facet of their diet, force it into a different population, and expect the same result. Yeah. One thing we know definitely doesn't work, though, is taking indigenous tribes that haven't been exposed to modern foods and plopping them in a McDonald's in the USA, right? That goes horribly, horribly wrong in the sense that they're even 
worse adapted they're they're maladapted to being exposed to any of these foods whereas like we were we were eating junky cereals and mcdonald's and stuff as kids and we adapt is is my point to pretty much whatever life throws at us but it's very important to understand that (laughs) you can kind of guide these adaptations in uh, a, a healthful direction whereas if you just kind of like do what everyone else does well we know how that's going so, right. so exactly. it's, we import, it's very important to, to realize that there's some degree of education here that needs to happen for everyone who's eating and just being human because this is all very real. There are different levels of research evidence, which I love that you brought up in the book. Maybe you can speak to that a little bit because a lot of people are just throwing the term science around right now, whatever that means. Yeah, yeah and it, it actually really is out of hand. Uh, I was just reading up on... Uh, some new probiotic, you know, every once in a while, a new probiotic pops into the scene and people ask, what do you think about this one? What do you think about that one? And, it, you know, this product has three clinical trials and, and you look and no, one is a clinical trial. Two are just observational pilot studies that are being, but they're calling them a clinical trial. Why this matters is because not, not all evidence is the same. Right. As, as a loose parallel, if you wanted to know if, you know, uh, you know, McGee's Irish restaurant was a good restaurant. And you asked one guy on the street, he was like, oh, yeah, that's great. That's not the same evidence as 100 Yelp reviews, right? It's really simple to see that. The same parallel holds for scientific evidence. If it's one guy on the street, that could be one observational trial. Or it could be a meta-analysis of all the rigorous clinical trials and a summary of those clinical trials. So... This is one of the things that if the consumer can understand this, and it's not too hard to kind of click through on a reference mm-hmm. and then look at what you see. If you see anything about rats in the abstract, right, it's probably an animal study. If you see something about petri dishes, it's probably a um, cell culture study. Um, or if you see something like placebo controlled or randomized controlled, you know, then you know it's this higher level of evidence. And, and why this matters is because medicine and healthcare are built upon this uh, pyramid structure of evidence where the least assured to be accurate type of evidence is at the bottom. So animal trials, observational trials, and then at the very um, apex, we have either clinical trials or summaries of several clinical trials. And, and really the inception behind why I put this in the book was, and I, I tell this story a lot, so sorry if I told this last time I was on, on the show. That's yeah, all good. I remember I remember being on the, the gut health panel about five years ago at Paleo FX, and I felt like I was crazy because everyone was all about fiber, 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 we gotta feed our gut bacteria. And I remember thinking, have these people seen people with IBS and with IBD and how fiber and prebiotics may help some of those people, sure, yes. But a fair subset of those patients will be flared and many of these clinical trials have found a significant incidence of adverse events. And I really thought on it, I was quite frustrated for a while, and then I realized the problem was actually one that posed educational opportunity, where many of the people on the panel were citing observational data like the Africans with the high fiber, high prebiotic diet being so healthy, or mechanism, meaning We want more bacteria in the gut, so if we take prebiotics, prebiotics feed bacteria, therefore, it should be good for people. So that's kind of observational and mechanistic data, which is lower quality, and I was looking at the clinical trials, which is of a higher quality. And so I realized the problem here is we're not all speaking the same language in terms of filtering our advice through a lens of analyzing the quality of the data. And so that's the reason why that section is in the book, to arm the reader and the consumer with, okay, I hear different health claims. Let me go look at the references. And w- within a couple minutes, you could click through to a, you know the references and look at what kind of evidence do they seem to be citing and get a better idea for who is giving you the most disciplined argument. Because it's easy to say, well, I think this, I'll find whatever study supports this, or I think this, I will only cite a quality reference that supports this, and if the data is not there, shocker, I'll change my opinion. <laughs> Although, you know, that unfortunately seems to be seldom that that does occur. And I don't mean to be, you know, disparaging, but it is frustrating seeing how this game is played, where it's all like you're saying, it's all science, science, science. This is true. We are in the science age, so to say there's a study 
is no longer good enough. We really need a quality study as a footnote, not just some obscure animal study. Right. And then there's the issue of who funds those studies and, and are there any biases there? So when you do, I would I would encourage everyone out there to learn how to read studies at the very least, to, to some degree, dabble in it, because it is something worth pursuing. But uh, if you want to draw conclusions with any level of confidence, you have to do the work. And it's a lot of work, no matter what subject or rabbit hole you're talking about. Right, right. That's why I think following people that you trust um, you know, goes a long way. For example, in Healthy Good, Healthy You, there's just under a thousand references. And those were actually hugely informative. And I, I had to confront some of my own biases yeah. when I wrote the book. Uh, you know, I, I came from a much more kind of paleo diet friendly framework, but a diet like the low FODMAP diet, which can be hugely helpful for some people, is a bit philosophically antithetical to many of the principles we advocate for in the paleo community. And, and so it took me a little bit of kind of internal struggle. And then I realized, well, OK, like there's not one dietary philosophy that's best. There's a few things on the menu. Let's just look at indicators that a given individual may do better with one or the other and be more about guiding someone to what's indicated for them rather than just looking for more and more evidence that supports the one narrow view that I have. One thing that's more popular than ever, it seems, is the carnivore meat only dietary approach. I know you have a few takes on that. What's, uh, what would you like to share today? <laughs> yeah. Um, so that, it's really kind of a continuation of that same couple of things that I, I struggled with when coming from the paleo framework and then being able to see how there are some people with gut issues who need to go low FODMAP or low fiber. There's another diet called the low flex diet, which is low fat and fiber. It's fairly well studied for inflammatory bowel disease. And I look at the carnivore diet as a continuation of that same trend line where plant foods do seem to be somewhat difficult for the gut to digest. And, and so there, there's definitely a line of truth there. And I, I see the carnivore diet as something that we could endorse as a really kind of robust elimination diet. But if you can never reintroduce foods other than you know, or if you can never reintroduce from the carnivore and add in some plant foods, my position is that there's something else wrong with your gut, which does tie into one of the um, kind of themes from Healthy Gut, Healthy You, which is we shouldn't be trying to force a nutritional or a dietary answer to a non-dietary problem. And so if you can only go carnivore, then there's likely some leaky gut, some dysbiosis, something that needs to kind of be remedied. And I was an example of that also. I had a parasite a pathogenic amoeba. And until that was taken care of, my food tolerance was terrible. So I ended up going more and more restrictive. But to get beyond that, there was an issue that needed to be fixed in the gut. So I'm open to the carnivore. I think it's a mistake to claim it's a lifestyle or, or it's the healthiest diet. Um, I just see it being unnecessarily restrictive. And if someone has to eat that way to feel good, then there's likely something else that, that we should um, employ. You know, we can use it as part of this larger process, start there, and then we can start layering in some of the gut therapeutics and then give someone kind of their life back where they can go to a restaurant and have a salad with their steak and they don't have to worry about, you know, whatever. But the idea that we should just be eating 100% roughage all the time is, uh, you know, similar in some ways, but probably worse, like having been uh, run some marathons and training as a runner, especially when you do longer events, you, you know that you don't want a whole lot of roughage the night before you race <laughs> for obvious sure. reasons. So uh, maybe you can talk about fiber a little bit, because like you were saying before, a lot of people are very gung ho, let's eat 400 grams of fiber a day or whatever, like our ancestors did. But that's really not the whole story. Yeah, and, and there, I think there's this kind of deeper principle that we're touching on, which is any philosophical construct applied fanatically can be harmful to an individual. And, and Paul Check and I recently discussed this about religion, where you know religion, if it's if it's adhered to fanatically, can be detrimental. Um, you could make an, an argument that secularism could, you know, certain facets of anything really, gluten free, that's adhered to. Maybe you do have a partial problem with gluten, but if you become a fanatic about it, then you can drive yourself crazy and other people crazy, and it can become unhealthy. 
So I think that's the principle to keep in mind that these value systems can help people, but if they're adhered to fanatically, they can oftentimes become destructive. And, and that same thing applies in the other direction, going to the other end of the scale toward veganism. You know, coming from a standard American diet, going to a vegan diet shows a lot of benefit, and, th and those are the studies that will be cited. And so there, there's a truth there, and I'm not arguing that there's no potential gain, but what I think that misses out on, coming back to the levels of evidence, is when we have comparative trials, looking at a vegan diet next to a paleo diet, you know, it doesn't always tend to skew showing that veganism is better. Christopher Gardner, and some of his earlier work, he's over at Stanford, he found that there may be a favoring for a low-carb diet over a high-carb diet. Although, to be fully honest, that may have been because the high-carb diet was not the healthiest diet. They didn't, it was kind of like your crapitarian diet where there was, you know, <laughs> yeah. processed grains. So he did a follow-up study and in his follow-up study called the Diet Fits Trial, he constructed and pitted against a healthy low-carb versus healthy high-carb diet and he found more of an equivalency of the results. But the general point I'm, I'm driving at is these diets can all work. We really have to, I think, cherry pick data to show one is vastly superior than the other as long as we're keeping the, the constant of, of food quality there. That said, my, my clinical perspective has been more people do better on a omnivorous diet, perhaps leaned slightly toward the moderate to lower carb end of the spectrum. That's likely a bias that's a derivative of the patient population that I see, which is mostly SIBO, IBS, and IBD. So it's important that I disclose that. Yeah. Um, but then there are also people within that subset who they've tried carnivore and they felt terrible. And when we put them on, let's say, a vegetarian low FODMAP diet, they do really well. So I don't want to kind of obfuscate an answer to your question, but I think they, they can all work. Um, and if we cherry pick, we can make a case for one being vastly better than the other. But I think if we keep the consistent and the constant of food quality there, yeah. then we can make a case for most of them within reason. Yeah. That definitely makes sense, and, and I would agree with that. I want to bring up a passage uh, as well that was really interesting. Eating to control blood sugar is more important than eating to feed gut bacteria. Mm. Yeah, so, um, you, know, uh, you know, one of the other um, challenges when writing that book was there was all this hubbub about feeding your gut bacteria. And then what you would see with some people is they would go on a very high-carb diet, and that would cause all sorts of problems because they were focusing more so on feeding gut bacteria and not looking at their individual ability to tolerate some of these, these plant foods. So at least in my mind, it, it seems more reasonable to first make sure you're eating not so as to overwhelm your glucose capacity, because that's, that's the thing where, well, rice has all this soluble fiber, and, and you know, oftentimes these these foods will be accompanied by a fair amount of carbohydrate. Beans is another good example. And so what you could have happen is you're eating to, to, to feed your gut bacteria, but now you've gained 10 pounds, you feel more bloated, you feel more sleepy. And that's what happens when we don't look at foods as a, as a whole food, but rather, well, this one food is high in vitamin C or high in fiber. And we look at foods as nutrients rather than foods as um, you know, a more kind of global uh, or having a more global impact on the body. And it seems like there's a growing focus on bio. Uh, on, we're all individuals in so many different ways and targeting one <laughs> a one size fits all top down type diet for everyone just seems extremely inappropriate. I remember getting uh, IgG and IgE allergy testing uh, for foods back in the early <laughs> paleo days. And a lot of the ones that came up for me were 100, 110% paleo, right? Honey, right. avocado. Uh, what else was it? Tur even uh, turmeric came up. Um, a lot of things that I held really dear. I think I was slightly to, to coconut and, and uh, a few others that were just in every paleo recipe at the time. Right. Um, but it's so important to recognize that there is no, we aren't furnaces is not, you know, some sort of binary system. It's extremely complex. There's a lot going on. And even if avocado is great for most people, if you're allergic to it, or if you eat a walnut and your tongue swells up, <laughs> walnuts shouldn't be in the recipes anymore. And sometimes you, it's surprising, but 
people need to be reminded of that. Yeah, and, and kind of continuing on your theme, which I completely agree with, the, the, the body is more complex than we currently have the ability to, with laboratory markers, fully objectively quantify or qualify. But because many of these tests look scientific and they look more scientific than looking at the individual's response, we fall into the hubris of looking at somewhat incomplete laboratory work over that of the individual's response. And you know, using avocados in, as an example, someone may have a allergy test, IgG, M, A, that tells them that they can eat avocados, but that person may also be very FODMAP intolerant. And so the avocado may elicit a non-allergic, but still an inflammatory and GI response due to the FODMAP content of the food. And so someone could be needlessly flaring their reflux and bloating and diarrhea, but the test told me I can do it. Well, again, it's, it's built upon that hubris of thinking that that one marker tells you everything that you need to know. And this is one of the ultimate frustrations that I battle in the clinic with other doctors and also with patients is thinking that a lab marker tells you everything that you need. And one of the things I've repeatedly said is a lab finding is about one fourth of the data we need to make a clinical decision. We need your history, we need your symptoms, we need your response to therapies. We look at all that together with the lab testing and we use that to inform what kind of decision that we should make. So it's one of the one of the biggest mistakes I'm, I'm really trying to kind of sound the alarm bell regarding is yeah, we have all these cool tests in functional medicine, but we've definitely fallen into this vacuous territory of just treating lab markers and not looking at the individual before us and thinking through how to solve their problems. Yeah, and, and to continue the conversation about blood sugar a little bit and its importance, there are some new technologies that's making it more, much more convenient to track your, your glucose. But I wanted to ask you, so there are some, especially in the bodybuilding community, who are all about spiking glucose to build muscle and that sort of thing. How do you see that? Is, is Do we have like a, a glucose quotient? Is there a threshold above which it becomes damaging instead of helpful for building muscle and that sort of thing? Because it, it, it's a complicated conversation. Yeah, good, good question. And, and I don't know that I, I've gotten nuanced enough in that area to really be able to comment. Um, Usually for me, we're looking at the general response to an individual's diet, definitely partially through a filter of their, their gut response. And then as far as I go with dialing the carbs is we typically start someone a bit lower carb, not, not keto, but um, knowing that many plant foods and sometimes starches can bother people, we'll oftentimes start a little bit lower and then try to have them reintroduce carbs and, and see if they can just feel out where they feel better on a kind of carb spectrum. And, and that's, that's kind of built into the, the protocol and Healthy Get Healthy You. In terms of, you know, is there a best kind of post-workout anabolic spike we can get for muscle synthesis and recovery? Um, that's something I actually have a CGM here I'm going to be experimenting with soon to see if I can figure out for myself. And I do think a continuous glucose monitor on an individual basis, even though that's that's like a lab test, so to speak, but what you're getting is constant data that's always driven by your biofeedback, not just you know one static test, and now the next three months are driven by that one static test. You're looking at a multitude of different foods, how they impact your glucose, and then hopefully objectively correlating different blood sugar levels with how you feel, um, which seems to me like a more justifiable way of, of using a technology. But in terms of, is that something I have patients do routinely, and have I seen a certain trend? Um, I haven't gotten deep enough in that to be able to offer anything too um, specific. But it's important to note that that there are a lot of people who are having success with dialing their carbs down, not necessarily to keto levels, but dialing them down, kind of start going from there. Yeah, and I, I definitely don't think that people need to kind of choose between keto or high carb. There's a big yeah, you know, yep. There's a big landscape in between there, and also I don't know. Uh, one of my suspicions, and this is just my own clinical observation, I can't say I know of anything published on this, but so much of what we may attribute to low blood sugar or high blood sugar causing you know, the cravings or the fatigue or what have you, in my opinion, may be inflammatory. 
and I just I've observed my patients and all my and also myself when I'm eating things that seem to be inflaming me I tend to be more tired have more brain fog not sleep as well and I've observed this response where oh I'm a little bit tired I must need to eat and actually I've seen this in myself and with some of my patients once you get them off of that oh, I'm tired, I need to eat, my blood sugar is low, or just the cravings that ensue when you're in one of those kind of, oh, I'm tired, I'm hungry sort of yeah. downswings, people tend not to eat as much and also have a better handle on their cravings. So I do think there's something to the blood sugar regulation issue becomes a lot easier once you're no longer inflamed because a lot of the ups and downs that people experience I think are a byproduct of inflammation and and that's that's why I like starting with kind of a gut first approach because it, it clears out a lot of the well is this thyroid is it adrenal is it blood sugar and it, it really kind of gets a lot of the noise out of the signal so to speak and you go in the direction of liquid only for a lot of patients right well yeah so an in, in elemental diet is is one of the things that can be useful or even a, a modified liquid fast uh, for half a day or a couple days just to kind of give the gut that pseudo fast. I think if we were living more as hunter gatherers and only working four hours a day and spent a lot of time just hanging out, we could probably do a true fast because you just kind of hang out and then you could take a nap and then you go for a walk in the sun <laughs> yeah. and you've only worked four hours. Um, it seems much more difficult. Like, like people have to do a couple day water fast are usually in tip top shape. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't seem that most people can really do that. So this is where a modified liquid fast where there's some calories coming in, but they're really easy to digest because they're liquid either as a modified fast or a bone broth fast or elemental dieting seems to be a nice way to take some pressure off of the gut. And it's incredible when you see some people like <laughs> there's there's one YouTube channel that I watch that shall remain anonymous where the the guy like periodically he's not a health guy, but like periodically he'll go on a fast and you can tell within one day, you know, and especially within three, you just see him lose like 15 pounds in two weeks every time. It's incredible. But what it shows me is that there's something that he's doing regularly that's, you know, some food <laughs> yeah, at I'm least that's not right. working. That's the real message here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I would agree with you. And I, I also I think fasting is a great tool for people to kind of condition themselves up to. And I think that's something else that um, may be important just to mention um, where fasting may be like running, where if you go out and you run six miles and you haven't trained at all, you're likely going to be really sore. Yeah. But if you start with a 14-hour fast and do that for a few weeks and then 16 and then 18 yeah. and listen to your body, it does seem that that fasting machinery needs some exercise to really you know, operate most effectively. I would definitely concur with that. I've been doing fasting to some degree um, for, for almost 10 years now. When, when I started, it was just about pushing lunch until 11 or 12 instead of eating breakfast you know, at, at 7 to 9, whenever it was. Um, and that was really hard sometimes. But after doing that for, for one or two years, changing the way that I was living and also being in my 30s instead of my 20s, now I, I've been eating pretty much one or one and a half meals a day for many years now, five, seven years, um, pretty much the whole time. Like I, I, and, and it's very interesting to notice how your metabolism changes, how your training changes, over time, but I would I would definitely, um, from personal experience only, uh, when it comes to running and fasting, those seem to be related. When I'm trained in doing kind of endurance events and dipping into my glycogen, maybe hitting a wall, when you start just like dipping into that for a while, it seems like it trains you to fast better. Um, and, and I see these things as very related. So when you combine fasting and training, it can, it can get really interesting. But it's not like there's some solution there, like like the gold at the end of the rainbow. It's not the answer. It's just an interesting thing to try for some people. Yeah, and I, I would agree, especially as we're you know continuing further down this road of, of self development and conditioning. Um, fasting, just me personally here, fasting combined with cardio and then sauna afterward. Yeah, works you know, has worked phenomenally well, but you know, there definitely does seem to be a threshold and I'll even include in that cause I was also doing the, 
uh, Wim Hof breathing bubbles right. where there's like 30 hyperventilations and then exhale all the way and hold as long as you can. And during that hold, I would have ringing in my ears. I would feel like I almost blacked out for a second, but I had a certain threshold where I was doing it for a week and a half and I felt like Superman and then I crashed hard. So coming back to this kind of bio individuality, yeah. you know, we have to kind of pay attention to our, our threshold for some of these hormetic stressors, fasting, Wim Hof breathing, sauna therapy, because there, I think there's um, the the propensity toward, toward saying, well, this is good for you. So do more and more and more and more and more. Um, but there tends to be a threshold for which we can recover. And I learned that a few times the hard way. I was like, man, why am I super tired all of a sudden? It's like, well, maybe that really intense you know, hypoxia that you're exposing your body to in a fasted state after a sauna <laughs> Maybe you're going a little bit too, you know, a little bit too hard in that direction. Speaking of Austin Heat, I had that happen uh, in front of one of the, <laughs> on South Congress, in front of one of the food truck trailer, just kind of like places where they had a bunch of people hanging out at picnic tables and stuff like that. I was just getting back from a long run. It was over a hundred degrees, <laughs> and, and I hit the. Uh, the, it was kind of like a little sidewalk and there was a lip on it and I just kicked it with one of my feet and went straight down in front of everyone <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> and I was almost home but it's like that's that's the closest I've ever come to hitting a wall and I may have hit it right then because I, I was in rough shape you know but it, that's such a good point um, you need to train up to these different things whether it's fasting or endurance events or even changing your diet it takes time for our uh, for our bodies and the ecosystems of our bodies to really catch up. Yep. Yeah. Well said. And yeah, with the Austin heat, as I'm learning, when it's 100, I feel like it feels like 110. So yeah, with the it's, humidity, it's, it's legit. Yeah, it'll yeah. get you. One thing that helped me though for training outside, <laughs> it doesn't help if you just cleaned up for the day and you're like you're all showered wearing whatever and you're sweating. This it doesn't help. But if you're <laughs> if you're out exercising or you're outside, I imagine that I'm in a sauna. You know, and, and that kind of reframing of it on a really hot run when you're struggling and dogging through it, that reframing of it um, really helped. It, it took me a while to kind of work on that. But once I did, there is some sort of weird nirvana there um, that you can achieve mentally, even in those really rough um, conditions. But you have to do it safely and you have to be reasonable <laughs> about all of that. And you can't go after you can't do what Wim Hof does without doing the training that he's done. Right. Yeah. And that's probably what I fell victim to, which is just, we all do. You know, yeah. jumping. Let, let me jump in right at the varsity level. And, you know, I guess as long as you listen to your body and you learn from the lesson, then, OK, if you overextend, fine. But just don't live in that overextension and not, you know, be saying, why am I suffering from insomnia and energy dips and brain fog? Now, here's the question for you. You you probably have quite a few people coming to you who are just like, I'm doing everything right, but it's not working. Um, oh, yeah. What do you what do you look for? What what are the common patterns that you might find there? Yeah, uh, it's definitely a common presentation. And, you know, it's interesting because some people will say I'm doing everything. But coming back to our earlier discussion on diet, everything, what, within the paleo diet confines? Right. And so some of those cases, it's just low FODMAP. In, in fact, just recently I saw, uh, you know, one of them most prolific paleo authors I saw that person's sister and they thought well I'm going to be a complex case I'm doing everything it's like all right well let's just see we put her on a low FODMAP diet and a probiotic protocol and this person's year and a half chronic symptoms were gone wow. in about six weeks wow so um you know it's I guess it's easy for me because I've really looked at well we have low FODMAP we have uh, low oxalate, we have low histamine, which is another one. The low histamine can be problematic because it's a diet that if you're eating a lot of fermented foods, can be a problem for you. So you pretty quickly look at like someone's dietary history and you see, well, here's how you're eating, here's what you haven't tried, here's your symptoms, and here's a typical way that a problem with histamine will manifest, neurological, rheumatological, dermatological. So likely with you, we need to tweak the histamine levels, and then that may get you 30, 50% improvement. And then I usually presume that there's some type of dysbiosis in association with that, some imbalances in, in bacteria and fungus, for which a good probiotic protocol can work amazingly well. And oftentimes, dysbiosis is this thing, or, or SIBO, 
if we'll put that underneath the rubric of dysbiosis, is proclaimed to be, oh, you have SIBO, it's going to be a year to get rid of it. And I just can't overemphasize how, how wrong that is. Most of these things, if we get the right dietary tweaks made and we use the right gut interventions like a good probiotic protocol, that's going to be a game changer for a, a really large subset. But in that simplicity, there is also some complicated assumptions, which is you identified that your paleo diet wasn't quite the right thing for you. And so just one probiotic with not pegging that dietary change will not get you there. We have to have like, like the right dietary change for the individual. And like I said, that may get you 30 to 50%. Sometimes you'll see a 100% response home run but normally it's it's like a good step forward but there's still something lingering and that's usually the second step where you, you have a good well-balanced probiotic protocol and that's when you achieve that maybe 70 80 percent of people will see the resolution that they need by by that but you know it sounds simple but there's those few nuances where if you didn't get the FODMAP piece dialed in and allow some of those things to rectify then that you know that 50 percent of the gain wouldn't be uh you know wouldn't be captured so yeah um, you'll, you'll see, you'll oftentimes see people who are eating kind of as strict within their paradigm as possible, mm -hmm. somewhat uninformed about other paradigms. And so a big part of just navigating that, and then to complement that, there's a handful of really good supports for the gut. Probiotics are probably one of the best. Elemental diets are also good. Herbal antimicrobials, I'm sure people have heard about things like oregano and caprylic acid, um, and those can get you really far if they're applied the right way. And when it comes to histamines, food sensitivities, allergies, as a practitioner, you probably see a lot of things pop up all the time. Has that surprised you? Have you like said, oh, geez, I better get rid of peanuts because everyone has problems. Or, or are there any foods like that? <laughs> uh, any foods that are really common culprit foods? Yeah. The most common culprit foods are probably garlic and onions. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. Which may seem a little bit ironic, but, you know, they are, you know, garlic, if you think about it, actually, one of my patients said this, and I was like, oh, that's really insightful. So, you know, if, if you were a hunter-gatherer and you bit into a clove of garlic, you'd probably chuck that thing in the woods. Probably so, yeah. And I was like, you know what, that's actually pretty insightful because it is somewhat noxious, but it, it also does seem to be hormetic. But I think for those with a really sensitive digestion, outside of all the benefits that one can derive from garlic – that seems to be one of the more common culprits that people have a hard time bringing back. And now I'm not saying don't eat garlic, but I'm yeah. just, you know, point I'm making is that tends to be, again, it is one of the, under the umbrella of high FODMAPs, it's one of the harder ones that people have uh, a time with when, when doing their reintroduction. So is that raw garlic, does it matter that much when you cook it in terms of digestibility and how your body reacts? Good question. I haven't gotten that level of um, granularity from the feedback from my patients. I'm assuming some are doing raw, but most are probably doing cooked because I, I think most of my patients know that cooking helps pre-digest and make things a little bit easier to deal with. Yeah. And I'm, I'm assuming that raw is probably going to be the, you know, the hardest for people to tolerate. Yeah. And I'm curious because it seems like with many of our foods, we still have those foods and we consider them foods, but we don't do the traditional preparation that all of our ancestors you know, uh, knew that they had to do to make it digestible or to make it safe. Yeah. Now, because of industry and, and cutting corners or just not knowing any better, we present these foods as foods, but they're highly problematic without that degree of processing. Yeah, yeah, it's a great point. And I also think um, I was having a conversation with uh, Anthony Gustin from Perfect Keto the other day, and he made a, a good comment, which was he noticed his vegetable tolerance was much better when he stopped shopping at Whole Foods and started shopping at local farmers markets. Interesting. Which actually makes sense because there, there's likely, if you're getting spring mix from Whole Foods, it's likely this this whole kind of supply chain of the same greens. The same exact subtypes of every, you know, lettuce leaf or Swiss chard or whatever. And so, you know, borrowing from the concept of acquired intolerances where if we eat the same food too many times, we can become intolerant to it and why kind of eating seasonally is so important. Well, within that same kind of philosophy, we could say that 
the local farmer's market will give you even more of that, whereas Whole Foods is probably going to be, again, that same supply chain where it's the same exact type of char. And so maybe just getting that little bit of a nuanced difference um, can, you know, attenuate some of these potential reactions. And freshness, too, I would imagine would matter. Oh, yeah. In, yeah, in, point. in indigenous uh, cultures and, and some today, they believe that there's more spirit in a native food grown on the native land that you eat there. And having traveled to different places, it's certainly a different experience eating the foods there as opposed to when they're shipped to you here and you're, you know, eating them on your couch. There's there's definitely something else going on. But we're coming up on time, so I, I want to make sure we uh, just cover quickly what to do about stress and adrenal fatigue because there are a lot of things going on all around us right now. And I think we're all kind of feeling that we might be at full full throttle running out of gas. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> Yeah, so, oh man, so much to say here. Let me try to uh, reach for the most salient. Um, I think taking a walk in nature, preferably with a friend if you can, unless you're a real introvert and then maybe by yourself. Um, but, but there's this large body of research mainly being pioneered in Asia showing that leisure time in nature is therapeutic, whereas leisure time in an urban environment doesn't seem to ha have that same therapeutic response. Um so there, there's definitely something about getting into natural environments, and we know that those who live in green zones or near green zones, forests, or blue zones, oceans, have a longer life expectancy. There is something therapeutic about nature. So um, getting in nature and then walking is also one of the fundamental pieces of, of health, and, and some have um, – I, I believe there, there's a, a mechanism through – Walking as it exercises different sides of your body leads to more hemisphere cross connectivity through the amygdala, I believe, which helps attenuate and process stress. Yeah. So walking in nature, I think, is one of the best things that you can do for your health. And I'd like to just quickly juxtapose that with getting an adrenal test. And this is this is one of the things that we we just recently um, published a case study at our clinic about someone who saw another functional medicine provider. His main complaint was quarterly he goes to Asia for work and the stress of time zone disruption kind of wears him out. No other real complaints. The other provider had him do $2,300 worth of lab testing. And they did an adrenal test and they gave him, and I'm just going to be a little bit kind of uh, couth about this because I want to be, um, or I'm not going to be couth, actually I'm going to be candid. I, I wanted to get to the, the point, which is they did a bogus adrenal test, which if, again, I'm being a little bit callous. Most adrenal tests are really not clinically helpful. That's been published. A, a, a pretty well done criticism of this. Um, over 50% of the time, they did not correlate with fatigue scores, is what the study essentially found a systematic review coming back to that apex level of evidence. So this gentleman spends $2,300 on lab testing. He's told he has adrenal fatigue to avoid one of his few morning pleasures, coffee, to instead have lemon with maple syrup for six months, take a bunch of supplements. And he felt no better on the six-month plan. Oh, no. <laughs> he, and he was made to think he had a, 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 I don't know if I'd call it a disease, but a condition of adrenal fatigue and how to give up a simple morning pleasure. We had him and one of the doctors at our office essentially gave him some simple tips about circadian health. So making sure you, you know, as you make that shift, you get the natural sun exposure in the morning. You have the dim light exposure at night. Gave him a few antioxidants and exercises to help keep him moving and, and keep him more in alignment after the long period of sitting. Did one blood panel just to keep track of a few things for a few hundred dollars. And this gentleman saw almost immediate improvement. Um, so just because you're stressed and you're not feeling well doesn't mean some sort of expensive test is needed to quantify what you should do. And I know it's so simple to think, well, and this is something patients say all the time, I'll do anything to feel better. Okay, doesn't mean that we have to just blow your money on a bunch of tests, right? <laughs> There's a time and a place, definitely. Um, but I just share that example of, you know, to try to prevent people from falling over the edge of, oh my God, I'm stressed. I must not have adrenal fatigue. Now I have this thing. And every time I don't feel well, I think about, oh my God, it's that thing. And it builds up in your psyche. That's so unhealthy for people. Yeah. We are all human, we're all amenable to stress. And there are simple things you can do to de-stress your body. It doesn't mean that you have a thing. 
Uh, so walking in nature, I think, is a phenomenal uh, one. And then time with people and connection is another. Uh, so sorry to be a little bit preachy there, but I just see how people get they get fed these these, you know, you have this condition and now it's just this runaway narrative. And whenever they feel tired, they kind of go on Google and they look up. Oh, my God, that's another symptom of adrenal fatigue. They didn't realize that they had it and it kind of further ensconces them in that belief. And it's so disempowering. And that's why, you know, I'm, you know, I'm trying to just help push people into a better direction of it's normal to have ups and downs doesn't mean anything is wrong. And there's some simple things we can do to help with that. And it's important to also recognize that, um, people think science is a hundred percent there, but when you talk about any test, testing your blood, your, your saliva, your urine, anything, um, some are, are highly accurate and many are not. And it's important to differentiate between, those and, and especially if you're trying to get a diagnosis for something that's going to be your thing, <laughs> it's it's yeah. very important not to take on, uh, you know, it, to use your example, adrenal fatigue when it's based on, you know, something that's completely bogus. So it's important to recognize that we really have to take responsibility ourselves. I think your book, this is a nice segue, um, is, is a great resource to have around because uh people want to you know think that dr google is reliable he is not <laughs> books tend to be much more reliable especially from trusted sources so before we go dr ruscio please tell folks where they can find you your work uh your book and all that yeah well thank you for the kind words you know i really appreciate that that book was about three years in the writing it was truly a labor of love to try to get people just a responsible narrative on this so that they don't fall into the fear of adrenal fatigue or unfounded fear of gluten and can just, you know, have the options in front of them with some guideposts on how to navigate them as effectively as possible. Sans the fear and the dogma. <laughs> um, so yeah, I really, really, really do appreciate that. Uh, the book is Healthy Gut, Healthy You. My website's drrusho.com, D-R-R-U-S-C-I-O.com. And they can plug into the podcast, the website, um, you know, pretty much Everything I do is, is kind of hub there and just really grateful to be able to share that with your audience. Right on. Well, Doc, you are so knowledgeable. We need your work more than ever. So always a pleasure to catch up with you. Yeah, same, same. Really appreciate it. Hey, folks, this is Abel James, creator of the Fat Burning Man Show and New York Times bestselling author. And this is just a quick little video I wanted to make for you about probiotic spheres from our family company, Wild Superfoods. And it's a blend of eight probiotics for a healthy microbiome. And what we're looking at here are these tiny, cute little pills that are spherical and designed to be uh, to withstand <laughs> going down your gullet and then into your digestive system with the probiotics intact to be delivered at the right place at the right time. Uh, and so it's a blend of a number of different probiotics. Another thing you can do with this is crush it up and use these probiotics to get other ferments going and, and yogurts and things like that. We've uh, done many experiments with these probiotics. And uh, one quick note, you want to throw them in the fridge when you get them. They're going to come specially packed so that they don't get too hot. You want to make sure you don't leave them out in the sun. They're sensitive to, uh, to getting too hot. But you know, these have been a reliable source for us of probiotics over the years, and we hope that they are for you as well. We're really proud of what we do over at Wild Superfoods. So from Allison, from me, my mom, the dog Bailey, and the whole team, we appreciate you. And uh, we can't wait to hear from you about how you like our new products, as well as the longtime uh, foundational supplements like probiotic spheres, mega omegas, future greens, vitamin D stack, and many of the others that we have coming your way. So this is Abel. Drop a line anytime. We appreciate you. And thanks again. Hey, it's Abel one last time. And I just want to say thank you for listening to this episode of Fat Burning Man. Before you go, please smash that like button, hit subscribe, or even leave us a quick review. It helps so much more than you even realize. And if you can think of someone else who you care about, friend, family member, anyone else who might appreciate this free show, then please take a quick second just to share it with them. Word of mouth is really the way that we've grown this show over the years. We have more than, at this point, 
four awards and independent media, 50 million downloads. We couldn't do any of this without you, so we really appreciate it. If you'd like to get in touch with me, then please follow me under Abel James or Fat Burning Man on your social media platform of choice, and I'll do my best to get right back to you. Now, if you want to keep this show coming to you, you can do something really quickly here. My wife Allison and I, along with a very small team, depend on listeners like you to make this show happen week after week. To join our next challenge coaching group or get in touch with me one-on-one, visit fatburningman.com. We also make group coaching free with your subscribe and save orders from our family company, Wild Superfoods, which you can find at wildsuperfoods.com. And if you'd like, you can throw a few bucks into the tip jar as a one-time donation or become a contributing member of our group on Patreon. Just look up Abel James on Patreon and you can join in the fun for as little as a few bucks and get my international best-selling book and audio book as a special thanks. You can also find that page at fatburningman.com slash tip jar. Now, a quick disclaimer for all those legal eagles out there. The Fat Burning Man Show provides general information and discussions about health and related subjects. The information provided in this show or in any related materials are not intended and should not be construed as medical advice, nor is the information a substitute for professional medical expertise, diagnosis, or treatment. The opinions and views expressed on this show have no relation to those of any academic, hospital, health practice, or other institution, including corporate overlords. We don't have any of those. If you or any other person has a medical concern, I wholeheartedly encourage you to consult with your health care provider. Whoo! Okay. Don't forget to join our newsletter over at fatburningman.com. When you sign up for our email, I'll even send you a wild quick start guide along with a few of our ridiculously tasty recipes, even Allison's famous chocolate nut cookies as a special thanks for signing up. This is Abel James signing off. Thank you so much for listening and have a great week.